Welcome to one of our leadership conversations during COVID-19. My name is Maria Crilly and I'm a project officer at the New South Wales Clinical Excellence Commission. My work is predominantly in the perinatal safety education, but also in human factors. At the Clinical Excellence Commission, we've been developing many resources to support leaders during the COVID-19 crisis and also for beyond. The leadership conversation series aim to help us to learn from our leaders, hear what they can share with us, what they have learned in their leadership journey and the tips for leading during a crisis. So today for our conversation, I'm very excited to be joined by Tony Locke. Tony's the Director of Patient Safety and Human Performance for Royal Perth and Bentley Hospitals in Western Australia. He's been working in healthcare for the last three and a half years and comes to us from a military and civilian aviation background as a decorated combat and airline pilot. And he's also a human factor specialist. Tony's also a leadership coach and a volunteer with Veterans Australia. And Tony likes long walks on the beach and he loves frozen margaritas. So hi, Tony, welcome. Hi, Maria. Thanks very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We're so glad to have you with us today. So first question, I'd just like to ask you, Tony. So what do you believe is a leader's main responsibility during a time of crisis? Like, I feel it must be about looking after your people because surely nothing's more important than that. But how do you do that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, that first question you asked me, how do you look after you know, so what do you believe the leader's priority is? And it really is looking after your staff. If nothing else, that servient leadership model of looking after ourselves. And, and people often ask me, you know, how do I do that? How do I do that? We've got new leaders in our organisation. And, and I, talk, I tend to think about four things. And the first one is, no matter how overwhelmed you feel, no matter how uh, distant that you feel from the team, you've just got one thing to do. And it's often the hardest thing to do sometimes as leaders when we swing our feet out of bed in the morning. It's just really show up. You know, it's extremely important to do this. You know, years ago, uh, visible leadership was not really uh, an essential, but it is today. It is very much um, a necessity, especially in times of uncertainty. Um, if you're the world's biggest introvert like me, then you're going to find this hard. But if you practice it, then you'll get good at it. So start today, give yourself 10 minutes uh, a day for a couple of weeks, speak to your staff, get engaged, and you'll be surprised what actually happens with it, and you'll start to feel a bit more comfortable. And I think, while you're doing that, the other important part is um, is listening. Just listen. If you do nothing else when you show up, just listen, especially in times of crisis. You know, you don't give, you don't need to give direction. You don't need to delegate. You don't need to task people. You just need to listen. You learn so much more. And there's a ton of stuff out there you didn't anticipate. You know, team members and colleagues will share with you all sorts of concepts, ideas, and even their fears. You know, learn to embrace that silence. I often tell leaders that that bag of tricks that you've got in your leadership toolkit, the silence and that ability to embrace silence is, is a, such an underestimated tool. Um, you know, the word, the way I look at it is the word silent, the word listen, um, anagrams by a coincidence. Um, it's so, so important to learn so much. And my third point is really be flexible in how you approach your own leadership style, but you're also planning on your day-to-day -day stuff as well as your strategic plan looking out into the future. You know, we used to have a saying in the military that the plan only survives the first contact with the enemy. We plan and we plan and we plan and we just knew that invariably one of those variables that you have to come up with and plan for is going to pop up and it, prevents it, it presents itself as a speed bump and then all of a sudden you've got to deal with that. You know, as a leader, we see leaders when these things pop up, it's not what they expected. There's a couple of schools of thought. Some people will throw the toys out of the cot, get quite frustrated at it and the team will follow that behaviour or other leaders will actually go, you know what? We plan for this, or we didn't plan for this, but this is how we can get around it. Let's get together, collaborate, and find a solution. And I think that's important, you know. I think sometimes as leaders, we feel as if we've got to have all the answers. And I'm like, sometimes I just tell leaders, um, you can actually be, be a bit lazy in this in this scope. And the term lazy leadership is a new one that's getting flogged around the internet there. But um, it's around getting the team to help come up with those ideas. You don't have to have those ideas. You just need to be able to bring people together. You know, sometimes because of our experience, we think, oh, we've got to have all the ideas, but you don't. And it's better if it comes from a team because they'll own it and do the job. Um, the fourth thing is be the leader your team are expecting you to be. You know, a lot of people I coach ask me, what sort of leader should I be? And my response is listen to your team and they'll tell you. 
you just have to pick up on the clues. Clues like, do you have team members that lack motivation, uh, lack the knowledge, or they're fearful, or on the flip side, they're highly motivated, but they're just lacking the, the stimulation and something to do. Like, our surgery has really sort of just taken a back seat during the pandemic, and we've got some of these highly intelligent, efficient minds sitting around, and you know, if they can't go on leave, we've employed them in other areas, and we're using that, uh, that incre those incredible people to help us with strategic planning. So. You know, is there conflict within your team? Uh, communication difficulties, poor behaviour, and really, what leader would I like to be in that situation, or would I like to see in that situation? Do I need to be more coach-like, more supportive, more directive, more delegating, or just providing guidance? So I think I tend to think when I go into a situation, I look around the room and I think, what leader would I like to be or see as one of these team members standing up in front of people? So this yeah. is my top four. I love them. So show up and listen, um, be flexible, but most importantly as well, be the leader that your team expects of you. Um, I think that is really, that's really important. And I think that um, people often tell me, you know, how do I lead? And they ask me, you know, role modeling is the most underestimated form of leadership. Just be that leader that your team want you to be. You know, you've got the values of the organization, be untouchable in that case, you know, and then really, They've got no recourse. They have, they have to sort of be a part of that. And anyway, I could go on for hours. I've interrupted you. Go ahead. Maria. Take them with you. Eh? So one thing I want to then move on to is just, you know, we often hear about leading from the front line and we hear people say we need to get out and lead from the front line. But what does leading from the front really mean? What, like, what does it mean to you, Tony? And is it about getting out there and being hands on? It, and, you know, is that helpful to your teams? Mm. What do you think? You know, there's, there's a really good balance here that we need to strike as leaders, I think. And, um, and I'm, I guess, and we've all seen it, that cringeworthy uh, leader that just thinks that they're doing the right thing. They get their hands dirty, but they're just getting in the way. We know that they're meaningful intentions, but, you know, and you just want to pick them up and just stand them in the wings and go, yeah, we love what you're doing, boss, but just wait there. Um, you know, if a leader is leading effectively, it doesn't really matter where they stand. You know, initially with a new team, you might have to be one of those leaders that leads from the front to role model those behaviours or acts that you want the team to do or show or demonstrate or uh, encourage. But then other times you might need to be that leader that just steps back and encourage and develop and let that team shine. And that usually comes with teams which are very well structured, they've got a lot of experience, you know, some of our ED teams in our hospital are so fantastic. And you see their leaders sort of stand back and just watch this incredible sort of teamwork come together in times of crisis. And, and then those leaders can provide support or give control where it's needed. That's a big difference between leadership and a big difference between control. So how do you get that right? That's the $64 million question. Again, look for the cues within your team and think about the experience levels in the situation at the time, you know, if they're really struggling, they may need that guidance. They may need you to step up, but other times, more often than not, it's your language, and language is, is powerful in leadership, and it's really motivating, so you might need to stand back, but it's case dependent, Maria. Sorry, I can't give you a concrete answer on that one, but that's why we paid as leaders to figure that out. <laughs> Good job. Okay, so... I guess it's just getting balance, isn't it? It's, you know, what you're saying, Tony, is it's really about getting that right balance um, and just, you know, going with it, really. Um, oh, for sure. And I think, um, you know, it's it's so easy for leaders to to feel overwhelmed and want to panic. And and the one thing I learned as a, as a junior, junior officer in my leadership journey was really about leadership states are transferable. So if you're a leader that um, it doesn't really respond to stress that well and you're and you're walking around and you're looking stressed in your face and, and you're thinking um, and you're panicking and you, the, your staff will follow that. They'll mimic those behaviours and they'll think, well, gee, the boss is stressed. I need to be stressed. Yeah. But um, on the other hand, if you're a leader that's calm and collected on the outside, but you're absolutely sweating bricks on the inside, you're feeling like you're going to vomit, you've just got to be that person that exudes that calm exterior. And one thing I learned with working with special forces over the years in absolute times of crisis, in life and death situations, and we do have life and death situations in our hospitals around this country, is that calm is contagious. If you're calm, everybody else will be calm. And just to remember that the body never lies, 
So we're going to exude those, uh, those, those stress, those body reactions, and we communicate, what, 70% in body language. You know, if your staff can see it, they're going to see it probably well before you will actually see that you behave like this. So, um, you know, and it may just mean that if you're a leader, especially in these times, and I've seen some of our great leaders and some of those people who stepped up that we didn't think that they would be in a leadership capacity have just gone, you know, hey, everyone, I'm feeling stressed and overwhelmed too about this situation we're in, in this COVID-19 pandemic. You know, I'm not sure what we need to do right now at this point in time, but one thing I am sure about is that we will succeed in whatever we do. I want you to help me achieve this and we'll beat this together. You know, a quote like that immediately diffuses the situation, flattens the leadership hierarchy and gradient in the room. You've de-stressed the super stressed in, in, in the team because they're saying, well, the boss feels like me, but they've given me an opportunity to contribute, engage. You've motivated your team. It's a very easy thing to do. Try it. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. So many important points there. You know, I'm thinking like really being with your team, finding that balance. But, you know, it's okay to let your team know. It's okay to show that vulnerability and being honest. Um, you know, and I think just repeatedly going through that, that's great. You bet. So, you know, what during, you know, the crisis and times when we need to work at pace to get things done, just thinking about having to get things really done fast. And that's certainly been the case so far through the COVID pandemic um, and other crises. How do we remove um, some of the barriers that maybe exist to us getting things done quickly? For example, you know, there may be existing things in place, um, maybe, you know, policies that have been and they might just seem to be in the way. What do we do about those? And I'm sure all of our listeners today would have seen certain shortcuts in governance or policies and procedures and we've seen it here with you know the recruitment drive in the anticipation of our icu going from 20 beds up to almost 60 beds and so forth and uh, uh, hda departments getting stood up and things like that it's like how do we recruit these people you know we need a shortened process for the time so i have this saying necessity is the mother of all invention and i think when we look at that we can look at uh, various different policies that you know, we can actually shortcut, but at the same time, we still need to track what's going on. And I'm sure uh, leaders throughout uh, all our healthcare institutions leading today would be aware that the Auditor General is probably going to come knocking on the door to make sure that we've spent the public purse in the right way. Uh, and we can get wrapped up in that shortcutting of policies and procedures to in order to achieve what we think at the time is the best to, to get the, the most out of uh, for all the outcomes that our patients need. Um, so I have a couple of different ways of thinking about it. And I think, of, you know, uh, from the patient's point of view, what are we doing best for the patient in this time and our priorities? And I'll come back to that in a second. But for our staff, I think I start with the why. You know, why are we doing this? Like, we've got to give people the why. And I think as leaders, if we do nothing else apart from my top four, chuck in number five there and give people the why. Everyone needs a why and a reason to do stuff, you know. And what your why is, Maria, is going to be different to mine, mm -hmm. and you're welcome to borrow mine. But you know, for me, my why in this whole pandemic was to do the absolute best for our patients, 110% of the time. And if it meant, you know, looking at our governance processes, and we've changed that within our organisation, we've, we've decentralised command and given power down to where the information lies in order to make those decisions. But if we give people the reason why. And it just it helps them in, in the understanding. So when you're not in the room, you've given them the intent to continue on. And I think, um, you know, some of these rules and regulations and policies are written for an explicit, explicit purpose. And I can't imagine too many in the clinical space if you want a shortcut. But I think the real challenge here in the non-clinical clinical space is understanding the risk that when we do shortcut that, what are we potentially compromising in order to achieve the aim? And have we elevated that risk? And does it sit at the appropriate level in the organisation? And we map that as a leadership group in our organisation is looking at associated risks in the pandemic, shortcutting some of those procedures and going, what are the risks associated with this? What are the likelihood and consequences of this particular outcome? So it's a tricky one again, but you know, I think we just have to manage that risk and we're all good at doing that. Yeah, and I guess it's keep looking at, you know, keep reevaluating, looking and checking what we're achieving. And um, we put many things in and some of those things will be working and then some things will just not be working. 
and you know we change things overnight and then it looks like we've got to do it again how do we support our leaders to to stop things again if they know they're not working yeah that's, yeah. A, that's a that's a great question and and you know we've tried things and they failed and i have a, a saying i not a military saying but uh, it used to be if you're going to fail fail early yeah shrug it off get rid of that ball and chain of perfectionism that we drag around get on with the new one don't wait don't struggle yep. in what we fail. Don't struggle in that burden of we haven't succeeded, but shrug it off, bring the learning with you. It's exponentially there for us to grow and continue on. And I think as leaders, when we're not quite getting it right, how do we give that back to our leaders? It's really around feedback. And some people are good at it, some people are not, you know. Um, I'd like to think that I've had a bit of uh, experience in giving feedback, you know. Sometimes we can misconstrue feedback as uh, criticism. Um, but I think we have to choose where we get that feedback from. Um, and it really, I was just talking to a bunch of leaders, uh, emerging leaders in our organisation. They asked me this question around feedback. And I said, choose where you get your feedback from. There's going to be plenty of people that are going to chuck stones from the cheap sheets, from the cheap seats, sorry, to give you what they think is the best thing. But unless those other people are actually out there, you know, doing that with you, well, they're the people that are probably going to give you the growth and the, and the need of it. But, um, I wonder how many leaders who are listening out there today uh, reach into their bag of tricks and pull out a big bag of courage and say to their teams, you know, if you see me do anything and not quite right here, or you think I could be doing something better, I want you to speak up and let me know. I had this exact conversation with my team this morning, the patient safety and risk team, and I said, listen, I'm acutely aware that I can get bogged down in situations. I want you to feel as if you can reach on in and pull out, pull me out just to make sure that I can see forest through the trees because I know that sometimes I can get task fixated and buried in one particular thing and and they said to me you're the first leader that's actually told us that and and I sort of said well if I'm not being vulnerable with you guys I can't expect you to be vulnerable back with me and we know Dr Brene Brown and she's appeared on TED Talks and Netflix and things she talks about vulnerability and, and she talks about the fact that sometimes as leaders we need to have those uh, accountability conversations or what we call as difficult conversations. I don't call them difficult, I call them essential because if you're not having them, you're not growing. And if you're not having them as a leader, sorry, that's the epitome of privilege. Get out there and have them because bad news doesn't get better with age. And sometimes we have a joke in my old uh, organisation that you couldn't see the boss's face behind the desk because of all the stuff piled up underneath the carpet in front of his desk. So you had to you know, work around the difficult conversations needed. but. Uh, there's a great gentleman by the name of Adar Cohen, uh, C-O-H-E-N. He's on the TED Talks and he's a conflict resolution expert in the US and he's got a great TED Talk uh, where he was uh, drawn into uh, a local prison to have a difficult conversation with the inmates and the prison authorities. And I thought, my God, would that have to be the most difficult conversation ever? To check him out on TED Talk and he talks about three things when dealing with difficult conversations, leaning into the conflict, don't run away from it, step into it, stay curious, and point number two from before, just listen. Brilliant, brilliant. So, Tony, in your bag of leadership tricks, I'm going to go back to that. Um, there's a lot of hard choices had to be made by leaders, um, you know, during this time and in, during times of crisis, a lot of difficult things. What are essential, you know, what can you pull out of your bag of leadership tricks to help when you've really got to make those hard choices? Great question. And we're making hard choices every day. And I would think that it um, doesn't matter where you sit in, in hospitals or in healthcare. I think our patients see us as leaders, whether we're greeting them at the front door as a security agent or, or um, a consultant in oncology or as executive director. Um, it doesn't matter what we do. There's a couple of things I think we can do. And I've sort of done some coaching with our team is really the first one is be collaborative in every sense. Be open, be curious, listen with the intent to be curious. Don't listen with the intent to reply in meetings. Stay curious in every single way. Um, you know what, you don't have to make all the decisions or come up with the ideas, but you know, as leaders, we are entrusted to make decisions. And the worst thing about making decisions is actually not making a decision. Yeah. So if you're entrusted as a leader and people are looking for you, and we've all been in that spot where we just hear people say, I just want him or her to make a decision. So make it. It may not be the right one, but you know what? Leadership's one of those things you're going to get right, you're going to get wrong days. So be collaborative in every sense. 
The next one is really something I do every single day is I prioritise and execute. I know what I have to achieve in the day and I look at it and I go, what are, what are my priorities for the day? And then I execute each one because sometimes we write to-do lists and we yeah. think we get to the end of the day and we think, oh, I've only done one or two things out of that list of 10. Yeah. Did I actually prioritise them in the first place and did I execute them or with my team? in a manner that everyone was aware of. So prioritise and execute every single day. I even do it, even trying to get my seven year old to do it is, is hard in the mornings trying to get his shoes on to get his breakfast done, but he's coming around. So we'll see what happens. Um, the next thing is, is trust. You've got to trust your team. And this is where vulnerability comes into play. The two are so interwound. If you can show a bit of vulnerability, if you can really build that trust with your team, be courageous, you know, show yourself because like it or not, you're going to bring the, the best and the worst of us to work every day. The trust is built in those smallest moments. And if you know you betray that trust or if you fracture that trust, it takes a long time to build it. And uh, my last point is communicate, communicate, communicate. If in doubt, communicate. <laughs> and like, seriously, and everyone knows that. It's the power of communication. But when I say communicate, as a leader, make the implicit explicit. If we continue to hint and hope, thinking that our teams have got the message, there's a chance that they haven't actually got the message. As a leader, if you want your team to do something, say, hey, guys, girls, I really want you to do this. This enables us to do this. Because I'll take it back another couple of steps. Because you gave them the why, they'll understand when you say, I think we need, but hang on, I want you guys to do this. Now, it's all into our and language is so empowering with leadership, they can't exist one without the other. So, Prioritise and execute, be collaborative, build the trust with the team and communicate, 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 make the implicit explicit because the chances are if you hint, they will never get it. Summed up brilliantly there. Thank I you. love that. Yeah. <laughs> so leaders are also human and yep. therefore can't be perfect. And we have to face even the best leaders make errors. So, you know, what do they do? How do they role model being a human being and what that comes with and being a leader? So true. And I think um, I have this, um, I don't know where I got this saying from, but I love it. Everyone is perfectly unique. I think it's, it's fabulous. You know, the, everyone brings a set of tools, tips and tricks along in their day. And leadership is that human interaction requiring you to assess that human state, making the best decision you can with what you've got to reach the outcomes. And, yeah, I'm going to go back to vulnerability again. Some days you're going to suck at being a leader, but other days you'll succeed. And there's no greater feeling uh, when you see a team triumph over something that they thought was impossible or just could never be done. And that, I believe, is the privilege of leadership. That's them doing the work. You've just helped them get there. And it's. And I'm going to talk about Stuart James in a sec, but he has this great saying that leadership is about you and it's not about you. It is about you in the fact that your language and your motivation will lead that team to getting where they need to be. So that team enjoys the kudos, the outcome, the success. However, when they fail, it's everyone's job to own that stuff and move on. We own that stuff, that's where the growth is, but and to lead is such a privilege and that's the way I see it, especially for our patients and for our taxpayer. But I'll go back to that point that role modeling is the most underestimated form of leadership. And if you screw things up, Put your hand up and say you screwed it because they're going to know that you screwed up and they're just waiting for you to say something. And if you don't say something, that's going to be ticking away. And what that does is erode trust and erodes that potential for communication because you might actually not give them the invitation to actually speak up. But if they see you're human, they're like, you know, Maria, she's a fabulous boss. You know, I can just feel as if I can tell her anything. And they're just going to open up to you and tell you stuff that you can't see. And, uh, you know, when I talk about some of the work I've done with the Special Forces soldiers, you know, they see such tremendous power in vulnerability and there's always that courageousness that sits behind it. And, and they see vulnerability as not a weakness, but actually the most accurate measure of courage. And as always, we always know that there's courage on the battlefield. But, you know, leadership is, I say, keep it simple. It's not complex. It's fun when you get it right. And if, if you don't like doing it, don't do it, you know, yes. But I love leading teams. I love seeing people get the best out of out of each other. Um, but you know, it's really about you. And again, not about you if you know what I mean. Absolutely love that. And uh, <laughs> what really comes through from you, Tony, is 
privilege of being a leader. And um, I think that's a great way on, you know, in the words of Stuart James and in also in reflecting on leadership being a privilege. Perfect way to leave our conversation today. Um, so I'd really like to thank Tony Lock for sharing so much with us all today. Um, and thank you also to everyone who's joined us and listened and shared our conversation. We really wish you all well in your leadership journeys. And don't forget um, to join us again. Have a look on the CEC web pages and look out for future conversations and our other leadership conversations. But thank you, everyone. And most of all, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Maria. Take care, everyone.